the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, thank you, God, for giving us this day for our scholars to present their capstone presentations. May you bless them and give them the confidence needed to present them. In your name, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, all right, so my scholar's capstone project was uh, being involved in the flex team uh, under Friar Chris for an internship. Um, so my first slide over here. So for joining flex team, uh, going on encounter uh, between my freshman and sophomore year, as well as between my sophomore and junior year, uh, was one of the major reasons that I wanted to join flex team in the first place. Uh, encounter, for anyone that doesn't know, it was a week-long service retreat uh, at the University of Maryland uh, where we went out in different groups and to the community, engaging in various forms of service. After attending Encounter, I wanted to do something similar uh, at Curly, um, and I saw that opportunity through joining the Flex team. Um, the first thing that we did after getting the interviewing and getting accepted in the Flex team is we went on the Flex team retreat, and that brought us together as a group and introduced some of the things that we were planning to do throughout the year, which I will go over now. So the first uh, major thing that we did was freshman retreat. It was probably the biggest thing that we've done so far this year. Uh, it took a long time to organize and a lot of careful planning. Uh, as a senior leader at the retreat, I was in charge of a small group of freshmen uh, that I helped get engaged with the retreat and break the ice between each other. Each of the flex team members that were at the retreat had different roles outside of their small groups. Um, I was involved in the check-in table and I also had to help with some of the water balloon activities and was involved in some of the uh, critical moments outside in the fireplace. As a flex team member at the freshman retreat, I had a new level of responsibility to be the role model for the incoming freshmen and be a leader to them. Um, so that was an important transition from during my time at Curly. Community prayers. Community prayers uh, obviously have happened a lot throughout this year. Uh, Flex team throughout the year has been involved in organizing and executing all, all the community prayers. I've been involved in pretty much all of the community prayers, doing things such as uh, cleaning dodgeballs between dodgeball games, setting up and cleaning up after Catholic Schools Week activities in the auditorium, and serving communion at Mass in the gym. Uh, these roles have helped me develop a greater leadership role in the, sc in the school. And I think they're also valuable for my life beyond uh, after, and especially going into college uh, the next year. So for the freshman retreat planning, for the community prayer ideas, all these happen in the flex team meetings. Uh, flex team meetings, they happen throughout the year, and they're a chance for each of us to kind of collaborate as peers uh, to come up with ideas. Um, We've obviously we spent a lot of time planning for the freshman retreat. We started that at the uh, at our flex team retreat. We spent a lot of time planning for the different community prayers. We also do that in some of our senior Catholic leadership class uh, classes, and we also had to spend a time coming up with Catholic Schools Week, some of the different clothing themes for those days, um, as well as some of the activities we had to do. Uh, this year was kind of unique because most of the meetings were virtual. We did have a few in person, but most of them were virtual. And there is that initial challenge of sharing some of the ideas over Zoom. Um, but in the end, we had a lot of good ideas and we we're pretty successful so far through, uh, in executing most of the plans we wanted to. And hopefully we continue to be. Uh, these meetings have definitely helped me probably the most because you know they helped me improve my ability to work with others, uh, especially on a larger scale. As you know, despite the large amount of Flexi members we have, we end up having a lot of good communication. We end up having a lot of ideas shared between the members and hopefully we will continue to do so for the rest of the year. Um, in conclusion, Flex Team has helped me build and develop key skills such as responsibility, leadership, and working with others. Uh, the responsibility and leadership, I, I've seen most of the freshman retreat and the community prayers where you know, as a senior, uh, that's pretty important. And you know, I, I think that you know, we're supposed to be kind of role models for the freshmen. And, you know, that leadership role I think is important for any job I might have in the future and also going to college, my own responsibility I'll have. Um, and then obviously the working with others is very important to the meetings. Uh, you know, that's something that we've developed throughout high school, but the Flex team definitely has helped me develop that even further. And I think that's all these, all these different 
which are, uh, aspects, not all of them are listed on there, but they've all helped me to kind of develop the best going forward uh, for college. So that's pretty much it. Um, but I also uh, want to do acknowledge prior Chris because uh, <laughs> he allowed me to do this as an internship. I had a, a trouble initially um, finding an internship, or you know, I approached him about writing a paper, but he offered this opportunity. So thank you, Fire Chris, and that's it. Any questions? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Oh, thank you, Skangus. Yeah, uh, well, this Wednesday, we're going to do the uh, freshman field day, so that's kind of exciting. So I did have a lot of fun at the uh, freshman retreat, and I think it'll be pretty similar. Um, pretty much just throughout the year, just meeting and talking, uh, making plans for the whole school year, I think, in general. Is, so I'm excited for yeah. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> uh, maybe if, if you know, he wants to, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I wrote my paper uh, for my capstone project on growing up in Nazi Germany, in which I document the time. Uh, my grandfather, Nicholas Zindler, grew up throughout Germany from 1939 to 1946. So just starting off with a basic background on uh, Nicholas, he was born in Manhattan on April 9th, 1935, to uh, his American mother, Alice Antoinette Adams. Uh, who was actually the youngest ever secretary to a U.S. ambassador at the time, at the age of 20, to the U.S. ambassador to China. Um, and his father was Gustav Adolf Zindler, who was German and extremely patriotic, and this would eventually lead him to being an avid supporter of the Nazi party uh, as it developed just due to his um, extreme patriotism. And he was a rising young executive in the Nordeshore Lloyd, or the North uh, Lloyd shipping line for Germany, which controlled most of the trading from Germany to uh, just the, uh, the US mainly, with ports in both Manhattan and Baltimore. So because of Gustav's position in the Nordeshore Lloyd, they would, he would be moved to Bremen in 1939, originally just meant for a year to manage trading preparations throughout the ports there. Uh, and my grandfather, Nicholas, would learn German quickly because of its phonetic alphabet at the time, uh, and would start school there. Uh, but once the war started on September 1st, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, uh, this would quickly shift as his father would be drafted into the Luftwaffe as an AA gunner or an anti-aircraft gunner. Uh, he would actually shoot down a Wellington in Denmark and send the wing to my grandfather as a little toy for him uh, in 1941. Um, and my grandfather and his mother in 1940 would be denied entry back into the U.S due to uh, my grandfather being the child of a German soldier and his parents' marriage technically being uh, aligned by German law. Uh, and throughout this time, because of Bremen being a port city, it was constantly bombed and oftentimes my grandfather would have school called off due to teachers being affected by the bombings or just basic areas being too burnt up or destroyed to travel well. Uh, then they would move to Bra Braila, Romania, uh, where his father would be promoted to be a harbor commandant due to his position in the North Lloyd shipping line. Um, at this time, Romania was going through constant massacres of Jewish people throughout their cities, and um, my grandfather would be sheltered by his own mother from all the information of the Holocaust at that time. Luckily, there were no uh, like attacks on the Jewish people uh, within Braila, uh, but at this time, his mother begins to reinforce to him that he is only American 
and tries to get him to even like begin to swear off his own German heritage. Um, and this would be the last time where they actually have a secure supply of food, um, surviving off a lot of different Latin foods uh, that he would grow to love. Uh, but they would then be forced to move to Berlin where they'd live for six months. But due to constant bombings of the capital, uh, uh, they would quickly move to Dresden, uh, which was much further inward. And because of how the Wellington was for the Royal Air Force, it wasn't really possible to actually be affected by bombings at the time. Uh, but during this time, they would live in Dresden for a week before uh, his mother would quickly move them up into the Weiser Hirsch on the right Elbe outside of Dresden, which looked down on the city from a couple hundred meters, uh, because she knew that if bombings did eventually reach Dresden, it was way too flat to be able to actually escape or avoid any damage or even death. Uh, at this time, they'd be living on pretty much a turnip-only diet due to their extremely low income, and both of them would start to become malnourished, and uh, Nicholas would end up developing tuberculosis, in which he was put in an experimental clinic uh, run by uh, people from Switzerland. Uh, for two months, he was just repeatedly getting different types of shots, and at least he had a secure supply of food, but uh, they weren't finding the right treatment until they found out what the American treatment for tuberculosis was um, through information being transferred, and he would finally uh, be properly treated, but would have to return to Weiser Hirsch and once again live off that poor diet. Uh, on February 13th, 1945, at around 10 p.m., he would uh, be woken up to the sounds of planes flying over Dresden, uh, and he saw this array of green and red colors falling down onto the city, which he described as a Christmas tree drifting downwards onto the city. And this would actually be the beginning of the firebombing of Dresden, which would last for two nights and uh, one day, in which he was unable to sleep and just had to look out from his bird's eye view onto the city, just being consumed by fire and more bombs being dropped by the Allied forces. Uh, and after a few days, they would move, uh, try to find the nearest train station, and travel west, where they'd originally stop in Leipzig, which at the time was also being bombed, before traveling to Magdeburg, in which they'd have to stay in the central terminal there for two days. And during those two days, uh, two Royal Air Force paratroopers would end up coming in and opening, open firing on the entire people in the station trying to escape Dresden. Uh, so his mother would actually tackle him and, pretend, and pretended to be dead for hours on top of him so that he wouldn't get shot at all. And luckily, both of them weren't actually affected at all. But instead, uh, he had to just bear witness to hundreds of people just being massacred in front of him at the central train station, which would then just lead them uh, heading back to Bremen uh, for the rest of the war. And they'd arrive in Bremen 11 days after the Dresden firebombings. Uh, and this is where he would witness the roughest bombings he had ever seen, as at this point, the Allied forces had uh, aircraft bases set up in France. So they were just constantly sending uh, bombing aircraft all throughout Germany, hitting the main areas like Bremen, other port cities like Bremerhaven, and especially the capital in Berlin. Uh, at this time, they're pretty much eating nothing and just slowly starving to death, as because of his mother's uh, American blood, uh, no one would offer them food. And he uh, spoke about how he could constantly smell what his neighbors were eating, and they would have uh, actual surpluses because of the wealth that was still in Bremen because of its port city, uh, like trading habits. And uh, he would constantly just have to witness other people eating in front of him while denying him any food or anything as he just continued to get more malnourished. Uh, and the day the war ended for him would actually be on his 10th birthday, April 9th, 1945, in which the British soldiers would actually arrive in Bremen and at 6 a.m. open the door and begin searching all the houses. So when seeing this, he told his mother about it uh, and she would go out to attempt to speak to the soldiers. Uh, but unfortunately, they were actually Welsh. And since she was American, neither side could actually understand each other's accents. Um, and so they had to wait until English soldiers arrived a few days later, in which more trouble came, where they didn't believe that she was actually American and suffering, but they thought that she was a Nazi spy trying to get information from them. Uh, and not believing her story of having a 10-year-old son slowly dying, they accused him of actually being a dwarf and an accomplice Nazi spy for them. Uh, but eventually that would get sorted out, and she would find work within the soldiers as an interpreter uh, for them to keep traveling. 
And in 1946, they would actually leave from Hamburg to return to the US, in which he would have to relearn English from the British soldiers uh, and begin to decide really whether he wanted to keep this German heritage, which he ends up swearing off once he learns about what happened in the Holocaust on his trip back. Um, his father at the time was held in Russian encampment for uh, a little over a decade uh, in which he had to lie to the Russian soldiers, telling them that he was actually a piano tutor or tuner uh, to avoid any sort of uh, physical labor outdoors, which is where a majority of the deaths came from. And he was one of around 10,000 survivors out of hundreds of thousands of soldiers uh, that were sent into Russian encampment. Uh, later on, Nicholas would develop interest in German and its cultures again. Uh, and he gets a master's degree in German language and literature uh, at the University of Maryland. Uh, but once he finishes his master's, three weeks later, he was drafted into the US Army and stationed in Berlin. And uh, after seeing the construction of the Berlin Wall and everything going around there, once he returned home, uh, it kind of reignited his trauma for him. And he couldn't handle the idea of being associated with Germany ever again. So he'd swear off speaking about uh, his time in Germany and his childhood for almost decades before opening up about it again. Uh, and that's all. Yes, Nate. Uh, I actually interviewed him just over Zoom, and we sent emails back and forth about it, uh, in which he told a lot of stuff. Um, I mean, obviously, this is just a presentation, so I had to seed out a lot of some of the personal stories. Um, for example, uh, when he was uh, suffering with tuberculosis in the clinic, uh, he had made a friend named Bubby, who had um, a form of bone tuberculosis and was uh, terminal. and. Uh, he is the only person that actually like truly remembers Bubby because his family had already died due to bombings earlier on. And so that's kind of heavily affected him. And another reason why he kind of tries to avoid talking about it, uh, at least at the beginning, now he's more open to talking about it. But the main source of uh, research just came from the interview. But then I researched different bombings around the times that would have overlapped with his time in Germany. Um, and then obviously Dresden was a big source I had to look into when he recalls it personally himself. My internship ended before it even began. You see, when you're dealing with lawyers, if you hand them a contract, no matter how small, it is going to be scrutinized. And when I forwarded my internship hours confirmation paper, it created a legal dilemma. Apparently, private Maryland law firms cannot have unpaid interns, even during COVID times, which was my first legal lesson. And that is when my internship legally became a mentorship. The primary coordinator of my mentorship was Mr. Brian Cunningham, who was a 
who provided me with cases for my review and followed up with discussions about the importance of each case and how the outcome was decided. He also arranged for me to meet with other lawyers so that I could ex experience a variety of different law sectors. Mr. Bryan is a criminal defense lawyer at Franklin and Prokopic in Baltimore. He attended Loyola University as a business economics major, and he later went to the University of Baltimore for law school. When I asked him for the greatest piece of advice that he had about going to law school, he simply said, don't. <laughs> a sentiment that he shared with every other lawyer that I talked to. Mr. Bryan said that the most common thing that he hears relating to his occupation is people saying that they are good at arguing, so they should have been a lawyer. However, this could not be further from the truth. The last thing that a lawyer wants to do, especially one that specializes in criminal defense, is argue. Their priority is studying the cases and the laws and eventually even negotiation. A question that he constantly gets is if he has ever represented someone that he knew was guilty, to which he said this is something that he does all the time. His role as a lawyer is to get the best possible outcome for his clients, whether it is reducing a sentence or a fine to as little as possible or getting them off entirely on a technicality. Curley actually has a criminal defense lawyer that you may know, Mr. Michael Gaffney who still has his licenses and has occasionally represented clients during his tenure at Curley. After hearing about my interest in the business side of law, Mr. Bryan introduced me to his associate, Mrs. Molly Callahan. Mrs. Molly went to Tulane University for law, after which she worked for a time in business law. She is now a criminal prosecution lawyer at Franklin and Prokopic. Ms. Molly told me that law is a lot about who you know, so it is important to, be, to establish a good relationship with your administrators and paralegals because you never know who they know or how they can help your future law career. I told Ms. Callanan that while I have an interest in business law, I have always found criminal law fascinating. That is when she introduced me to white collar law, which is a bit of a combination of both. She introduced me to another lawyer, Ms. Suzanne Cohen, another graduate of Tulane University who now is a white collar lawyer. Ms. Suzanne handles financially motivated crimes committed by businesses and government professionals. She told me that not many people want to do economic law, which while it sounds, some, it sounds good for someone aspiring to be an, an economic lawyer, it actually means there aren't many open spots for people looking into the profession. Most companies have one or two economic lawyers who remain there for life. Mr. Bryan introduced me to one more lawyer, a patent slash intellectual property lawyer, Mr. Brian King, a graduate of Delaware Law School. Mr. King explained many modern issues, issues between the relationship between laws and the internet. He basically said that legal professionals are making it up as they go along. This is mostly because of the ancient copyright and trademark laws that the United States has. Trademark laws were passed in the 1940s and copyright laws are in the Constitution. One of the most pressing issues nowadays is the question of websites' protections on the internet, or rather, the line between free, spe free speech and content liability. You have probably heard about Section 230 and the debate of what determines whether they can profit off of what they aren't liable for. Mr. King told me that law school is very much an old school profession, meaning that many companies will consider where you went to law school, what you did there, and your LSAT scores when looking for your application. This means that good undergraduate grades are crucial, especially for getting into a well-known law school. Mr. Bryan told me that you can basically major in anything in undergrad and still go to law school. In fact, many companies appreciate a diversity so that they aren't just getting 300 poli-sci and pre-law majors at, who are basically just the same person. For example, many people with engineering degrees go into patent law and other technical careers while many accounting majors go into tax law. He also told me that it is important to complete internships in a section of law that you are interested in so that you can get a sampling for the type of work involved in it before you are committed to the sector. My mentorship was an overwhelmingly positive experience. I learned so much more than I thought I would, and despite their efforts, none of the lawyers dissuaded me from my interest in law. I also developed an interest in many different types of law, mostly white collar law, which I hadn't even considered. My mentors confirmed that my current plan to major in business and minor in theater will prepare me well for a career in law. 
This experience also provided me with more than just an, an understanding of law. I was also able to build a network of great lawyers who told me to contact them at any time. I think that the most important piece of knowledge that I'm taking away from this experience is that who you know is extremely important in the law field. I am excited about taking up all of these lawyers on their offers, and I look forward to being able to complete a law internship in the near future. Yes, Mr. Brian, uh, he is a, friend, a family friend, but he is actually the fourth lawyer that I had to go to in order to get this internship because I had already made plans to do an internship with three other lawyers before him, but those just sort of fell out because of COVID or other things that just didn't work out. So my mom just happened to run into him at a Target, and that was, hey, it was a positive experience. So, yeah, just worked for a reason.
All right, so this is my presentation. Um, I did a critical analysis of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon album. So just some basic information about the album. It was Pink Floyd's eighth album, uh, released on March 1st, 1973. It was written by Roger Waters, David Gilmour, Rick Wright, and Nick Mason, and Alan Parsons was the engineer. It's one of the most successful albums of all time. It has sold more than 45 million copies worldwide and has been on the Billboard 200 for at least 937 weeks. So going into some technical aspects of the album. So just, just some instruments that are mainly used. Uh, the main one is gonna be a BSC-3 synthesizer. Um, that's a pretty, that was a pretty new instrument at the time. It was one of the first portable synthesizers. One of the songs that it features most heavily in is On the Run, the second song of the album. There's also lots of electric guitar. This was played by Gilmore. Like, it, that could be altered with equipment, such as a whammy bar. Uh, a good example of, of the electric guitar is In Time. There's also keyboards and pianos, which are played by Rick Wright. Um, a lot of piano is featured in The Great Gig in the Sky. There's also drums, which are played by Nick Mason. The opening of Time is a good example of his playing. And then Roger Waters was the bass guitarist. However, there are also instruments used less often, but still play an important part, such as organs, saxophones, and slide guitars. And that, that's a photo of, of the SC3 synthesizer. In addition to instruments, they also use lots of recordings and sound effects. Uh, they often recorded conversations and put them directly into the songs. So uh, the first song on the album called Speak To Me opens with a man saying, I've always been mad. That's, uh, that's, actually, um, that's actually Chris Adamson, a road manager for Pink Floyd, and Jerry Driscoll the doorman at Abbey Road, the studio. So that's just their voice being recorded. Um, there's also a recording in The Great Gig in the Sky. It opens with someone saying, no, I'm not afraid of dying. In addition to those recordings, they also use sound effects. So in the beginning of time, um, it's pretty iconic, but there's just like a section of just a whole bunch of clocks going off at the same time. So that was recorded by Alan Parsons, who was in a, uh, who's in a clock shop when they all went off. And then Money also uses, that uses sound effects from a cash register. Uh, those were recorded by Roger Waters. And eventually they blend into the rhythm of the song. So in addition to uh, the technical aspects, there's also a very, um, a very distinct theme throughout the album. In order to understand the theme, we have to understand who Sid Barrett was. Uh, he was one of the founding members of Pink Floyd, one of the four founding members. Uh, to compete in the music industry, um, he began using LSD. A lot of musicians use this. Uh, they believed it gave them more progressive ideas. However, his increased use of this exasperated pre-existing mental illnesses. Eventually, he, he completely lost his sanity and had to be replaced by David Gilmour but he still had an influence on the album or on, on the band as seen through this album. So the first, the first couple songs, I'd say the majority of songs, represent a pressure that Sid Barrett would have faced. Um, for example, time represents a fear of being left behind. So uh, as the music industry was progressing very quickly as a result of increased use of LSD, he, he would have also had to use that. So in order to stay ahead of the competition, in order to keep on producing this new stuff, he, he uh, well, he started using more, more drugs, which, um, as I explained, exasperated his mental condition. Um, some, other, some other examples of stressors are, are uh, money, which is in money, that's the, it's the pressure of continuously trying to gain more material wealth and how 
um, how he would have had to continue uh, using LSD, continue trying way too hard in order to, to compete. Uh, then there's On the Run, which is a representation of the fear of traveling. On tour, he would have had to travel very often, and uh, traveling can be a very, um, a very stressful environment. Then the last two songs, which are um, last three songs, Any Color You Like to Eclipse, they represent the effects of the pressures. So um, they, they conclude the album, and in, in these songs, there are the most references to mental illness and mental health. So in, in Brain Damage, uh, the second to last song, they, it literally says, I'll see you on the dark side of the moon, which is a reference to um, mental illness. The moon is often associated with, uh, with insanity, such as in the word lunatic. The root word is luna. Um, there's also re allusions to behaviors that Sid Barrett would, would take. Uh, one line is, when the band you're in starts playing different tunes, that's that's an allusion to when Barrett would literally play the wrong song at a Pink Floyd concert. Uh, the final lines of Eclipse, the, the last spoken words on the album, are, there is no dark side of the moon, really. It's all dark. It's the sun that makes it bright. And I think that's that's quite an ironic ending, considering the whole album was, was devoted to explaining how Sid Barrett got to the dark side of the moon. But what it's really trying to say here is uh, mental illness is not worse or better, depending on the case. It's really the, the personality of the person that, that's being overshadowed. That's, that's what makes mental illness so up, up here so, so grave and so hard. It just knowing that the person that was is no longer there. They've been eclipsed. So just a conclusion, it's one of the most successful albums of all time. Uh, they used uh, a variety of instruments, uh, often used in, in, in experimental ways, and they also use sound effects to create the music. And it conveys how pressures that Sid Barrett faced contributed to his mental degradation. And, and that's it. So it, it's kind of a uh, kind of a funny story. I was I just found the song "Money for Nothing" by Dire Straits, and I thought I recognized um, another artist that I that I knew. Um, he was he was singing parts of the song. It was Sting singing parts of the song, and I was thinking about how like how society and um, how like how other musicians and how other music can impact music. And I was thinking of just some of my favorite songs, some of my favorite albums that also demonstrate this, this connection. And uh, I decided on this topic. So uh, I just thought it was funny how going from like one song that I found recently to, um, to a completely different type of music and, and different, different um, you know, sound. I believe so. Uh, so, I 
decided to do an internship for my capstone project. Um, I just, since I have somewhat of an interest in business, um, my main ma my uh, main uh, area of why I really want to go into is medical laboratory studies. But I also had a bin business mindset, so I thought I might as well do an internship for that. So I decided to do an internship with my neighbor, who is a payroll director at Genesis Healthcare. Um, she got a bachelor's degree in business from the University of Baltimore and worked her way up the ladder of the payroll department and then ended up in the director's position. So just as a brief overview of Genesis, it was founded in 1985 and it provides short post-acute rehabilitation, skilled nursing, and long-term care services. It, it has 325 facilities countrywide and their main mission is to improve the lives we touch through the delivery of high quality health care and everyday compassion, which I felt spoke to the values that we at Curly have. So I thought this would be a great place to have my internship through. So what my main tasks were, were closing out digestive facilities. These were facilities that were not under the umbrella of Genesis Healthcare anymore, or just they no longer existed. I updated contact information for the facility, which was a real pain going through all 325 of them. Um, it was a lot of typing. Uh, <laughs> I made sure all the facilities sent in their payroll reports, and I observed conference calls that my neighbor had and um, other email interactions with the facilities. Um, what I got out of it, I realized the importance of of uh, for employees to actually get their paychecks in a timely manner. Um, one of the main issues that my neighbors face, which I very much emphasize with over the 40 hours, is not getting the time cards or an errand time cards from uh, facilities all over the place. It's mainly West Coast. They were never on time or there was always something wrong. So there was lots of frustration that also got into my feelings. There's also just a lot to, it goes into making sure people get paid for what they do. Uh, and I came to realize it's not for me. Um, <laughs> I do not have the patience in order to do this job. Um, I'm more of a very hands-on type of guy. I don't like sitting still at all. So I realized it's not for me. Um, however, I could use this information later on pursuing my career, a possible career in medical laboratory studies was having a business that provides some type of, type of medical care or product, I could use this information um, in that potential business with payroll and all that. So that's my presentation. So for my capstone project, I spent three days in the wilderness outside of Ely, Minnesota back in January earlier this year. I, alongside the other members of my crew, set up camp and learned how to mush dogs at White Wilderness Sled Dog Adventures. My crew consisted of myself and eight other scouts my age. We flew out of BWI at around 6 a.m. to Chicago. From there, we flew to Minneapolis, where we got our rental vans and drove to Duluth, 
Minnesota, and Superior, Wisconsin. On the way back home, we had a layover in Denver, Colorado, to catch a connecting flight to head back to Baltimore. Overall, we hit about four states, including the layovers, and there was about 20 hours of traveling altogether, if you include the time it took us to try and find something to eat sometimes. The average temperature in Ely, Minnesota in January has highs of 17 degrees and lows of negative 4 degrees. Luckily, we were there, <laughs> we were there during the average high. Although there were 14 of us total, including the five adults, we had to split into two separate crews. Each crew was assigned an interpreter. My crew had Ryan Rothenberg, pictured on the right. Additionally, when the crew set out into the wilderness, each was assigned a professional musher. My crew had Kasha. Unfortunately, I was uh, unable to get a photo of her. Most sleds had two people. However, there were a couple sleds that needed to accompany a third person. It was important to have at least two per sled because that made it easier to control the dogs out in the field. Each sled has six dogs attached to it. It was also very hard to get photos and videos out in the field because with temperatures that low, when your phone s starts getting the temperature, like it will just shut down. Like at one moment I had 87% and I went to go take a video and I looked back at my phone and I had 1%. So. <laughs> While I was out there, Kasha taught me all the specific duties and important things you need to know in order to be a dog musher. Most importantly is you need to know how to check your how healthy your dogs are. No dog means you have no one to pull you out in the sled. This means feeding them just the right amount of food each day to maintain a certain physique. Kasha taught me this and then even let me feed the dogs mink chum. The dogs' mental health is just as important as their physical health, and I'll get to that anecdote in a minute. Always make sure you give your dogs the proper amount of love for working so hard. They are very competitive, and some of them even race, so it's important to keep the morale high. Uh, Kasha also cued us in with the various lingo related to dog mushing, such as G for left and Ha for right. Uh, sort of like port and starboard for sailing. She also taught us how to properly set up our own dog sleds and even harness each dog in ourselves. Finally, you never know when you'll be tra trapped out in the frozen wilderness, so it's important to know relevant first aid. I had to take a two-day long class on wilderness first aid before I left for this trip. My mushing partner was class of 2020 Curly alum, James Sandoval. Here is a list of the many dogs that we had on our team over the course of three days. Although we did have Reef for a brief moment on the second day, he was not a part of our team for long. Upon setting out, he had a nervous breakdown and did not want to pull the sled that day. <laughs> we ended up getting Turner in his place. So that, you know, uh, that's the resolution of the whole mental health story for the dogs. Like, it's very important to keep both their physical and mental health in mind. And here are the dogs. Here are here's six of them. Um, the best pictures I had. Uh, from the top left, there is uh, Kumo. Um, and then Random is over there to his right. Fitz is in the bottom left. Uh, that is Nandi, uh, followed by Fenny, and then Uh-Oh. Um, <laughs> Uh-Oh is named Uh-Oh because the two dogs decided to have kids when they weren't supposed to. So the, t the two kids that they had were Oops and Uh-Oh. <laughs> Um, although, mu although the mushers didn't join us, the crew was camping outside in which we practiced a lot of what to do in survival situations out in the frozen tundra. The original thought when we got there is that w we were going to build Quincy's, which are sort of what people build or think of um, when you build out in a snow after a snowstorm, like building like the snow forts. Those are Quincy's, um, whereas igloos are made out of ice. Um, we did not have any time to build any, however, because w when we got there um, to the site, the well, first, when we got there to the site, we immediately uh, learned how to set up a, a dog sled and went out into the wilderness. So by the time we got back from mushing the dogs, it, the sun was going down, and we would have had no time to build shelters. So uh, each member of the crew shoveled out a ditch in the snow and used the snow they shoveled uh, out to build a wall around them in order to break the wind. Even though it was warm there for the season, it was necessary to boil water before we went to bed in order to have an external source of heat that we kept in our sleeping bags. We had, to, uh, we had two sleeping bags at all times when we were sleeping. 
Um, we had to constantly be eating in order to give our bodies enough energy to maintain homeostasis out in the cold, harsh environment. And then here are two videos that I have. Um, so in conclusion, uh, it was an amazing trip. I learned so many things about like wilderness survival and just the science of living out in the cold. Um, it's such a cool job to be uh, a dog musher. Like sh Kasha gets to do that as a living, <laughs> which is so amazing. And it's even cooler that um, some of the other mushers, like they take these dogs out and they go racing like in Alaska or Canada. So that's, it's a really cool job um, and I had an amazing experience. Oh yeah, any questions? Yes, Lucas. It's a thought. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about going to college first and you know seeing where that brings me, but I mean it's a really cool job. So you know I won't close that door. So uh, over the summer, um, I, I, so James Sandoval lives really close to me, like down the street. And we had his family over the summer for Fourth of July, and he was telling me about this cool trip he wanted to take in uh, January of 2021. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. I really want to do it. So when we first arrived, it actually it's part of a, a Boy Scout high adventure trip um, called Northern Tier, but we weren't up at the doing any of the other Boy Scout stuff. We spent we had a different trip where we spent the entire time at this uh, dog mushing group. Other groups got to like go ice fishing and such, which was cool too, but uh, we did not get to do that. Um, but yeah, it was a really cool, it's a really cool opportunity that he told me about and like he told me about it and I was like, I definitely want to do that, so yeah.
Okay, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Joseph for doing our live streaming, Ms. Kangas, Father Chris, Mr. Malinowski for joining us today. But mostly I would like to thank you. I know it was not an easy task to find an internship or to write a paper during this COVID year. And I know that some of you, we were at the very end trying to find something for you to do to complete your capstone projects. I am very, very, very proud of you. You did a really, really good job. And I appreciate that. I also appreciate the fact that you put up with all of my nagging emails all year trying to get you motivated with this. <laughs> well, I'm glad, but you did a very good job. I'm very, very proud of you. Remember that on Thursday, you can watch your other classmates, or if you wanna make a trip back to Curly and a few of you sit in, you could certainly do that too. So you have a wonderful evening and thank you all very, very much. Thank you.